Okay, I have another question for you. What do you think comes after that? Who, who, not lunch, oh, maybe you for lunch. Who has successfully navigated the elevator situation with a Syngapian in the past couple of days? How'd you do it? He just started liking to push the buttons. Please meet me at the swag table later. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So for those of us in the community who have been here for a couple of months at least, six months, eight months, you have probably started to identify individuals who have particular areas of expertise in Syngap 1 who we all reach out to, we ask questions of, you see them respond to various things on Facebook and Slack about, has anybody identified what to do about this? Does anybody know about this? Can you recommend this? What have, how have you done, you know, those types of questions. So this next hour is going to be an opportunity for those experts in their particular area, so to speak, to impart some of their knowledge and how they've gotten over hurdles, what they have done, what has worked, what has not worked, what you can do potentially to try, and that's going to give voice to some potential solutions for all of us, okay? Who is our first? I forgot my agenda. Sydney is our first. Hooray, Sydney. Hello, my name is Sydney Stelmashek. My husband is Brett Stelmashek. If you watched any of the Cannonball, he's the guy who shaves off his hair and gets tattoos on his butt every year in order to raise money for Syngap Research Fund. And we're very proud of him for doing so. We have three boys. Um, Isaac is 12, Judah is 10, and our youngest, Emmett, who is our Syngapian, just turned six. We currently live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, we won the lottery moving to Pennsylvania before end was a thing at CHOP. We're very um, happy and thankful to be there. Um, today I'm gonna talk with you just shortly about um, the seizure journey in Syngap. We've certainly had quite the journey and um, it's really hard. Um, there's a hill by my house, um, a nice walking path that I like to go running on sometimes and when you're on it you can't see the incline but you can feel how slow you're going and how tough it is on your body and the other day i stood back and i looked at that hill from a, a different place and i thought to myself oh my goodness this hill is massive no wonder it's hard so hard to go up and that's what i think about epilepsy right now i've gotten so used to dealing with it that i forget that i am dealing with it until every once in a while I get to stand back and look at it from a different perspective and I realize, oh yeah, this is like really, really hard to have to deal with seizures all of the time. So Emmett was diagnosed close to 18 months old and it was in part thanks to his epilepsy. It was so severe that the epilepsy in combination with the developmental delay meant we really needed to go get genetic testing. And um, on the first panel that we did, the epilepsy panel with Invitae, of course, we got our Syngap diagnosis. So since then, um, well, actually, since before then, I think seizures started around maybe seven or eight months for him. We've not had a seizure-free day since then in his life. And he's nearly six. So, yeah, sorry. It's a little hard. Um, so we've tried so many things, right? We've tried eight different meds, sometimes five at a time. He has a VNS, he's done keto twice, really a lot of stuff. And um, I'm just gonna share quickly with you like maybe a couple of things that I think are tried and true for the Syngap community um, and that may be helpful for those of you who are also dealing with severe epilepsy or even just epilepsy in general. So um, some things that I think we've learned are that um, sometimes seizure freedom isn't always the goal. I'm so happy that for some of us, that is achievable, and that's a beautiful thing. It's great that not everybody has to have intractable epilepsy. But in our case, we've learned that we're really balancing the side effects of medications with the relief from seizures that they can provide. 
I was also desperately scared of having him on a cocktail of medications when we first got diagnosed because I was told that was very bad and you should avoid it. And although I think having one drug, if you can control seizures with that, is terrific and great, not everybody's going to be able to do that. And actually, adding a couple of drugs at more moderate doses has been quite a stabilizer for my son. Um, Another thing that I think uh, is really useful is um, just to make sure that you have chosen a neurologist who uh, is a good listener and who's willing to connect with people who see tons of Syngapians and have produced all kinds of data and helpful webinars and other things online that they can use to inform their treatment of your child. We've had a lot of neurologists over the years and not all of them have this, um, I don't know what it is, uh, ability or willingness to call people up and ask for their advice or to go read papers or to watch many of the webinars that we have on the website. And um, those who are willing to do it are golden because you may not have other Syngapians in your area. You may be the only one. But if they're willing to connect with people, and I can't promise you this, but one time I did have a clinician call Dr. Helbig and he answered on his European vacation <laughs> to give him advice. Not that he'll do that every time, but I'm just saying there's people who have seen Syngapians who are really willing to talk to your clinicians. Do everything you can to connect them. And if you have somebody who's not willing to connect, maybe they're not a great Syngap neurologist, just a humble opinion. <laughs> um, so I want to encourage you guys and um, remind you that uh, it's very good to be kind to yourself um, because it is really hard. The burden is really heavy. Um, it's difficult to train your whole life around helping your kid to do the things that they need without putting them in medical predicaments, as epilepsy uh, is often inclined to do. Um, and it's just hard. So my heart goes out to you. If anybody wants to talk about drugs or anything with me afterwards, then that'd be great. And I'm available. OK. <laughs> Thank you, Sydney. OK, next, James Edward is going to talk about young children. And if you see your name coming up, if you know your one of the next, please make your way to the front and we can save a little bit of time. Hello everybody. Welcome to Orlando, thanks for being here. My name is James Edward. Over here is my wife, Alexis Edward. You may know her more than me. I'm, I'm really not the expert, it's, it's really kind of her, but she doesn't want to be up here <laughs> at the moment, so um, I volunteered to step up here and. Uh, you know, um, tell you about a little bit about our story. Um, you know, um, uh, nothing significant in that sense, but just sharing our story with you um, to bring some light into you know um, our everyday lives. Um, <clears throat> we have four children. Sophia uh, is our oldest, 14. She's not here right now. Um, we have Isaac, our son, who's 12. Um, Naomi is sitting right there. It's 10 years old. <laughs> Big sister. Uh, and Naya is the little one on the iPad. I'm surprised she's very quiet right now. I'm happy about that. <laughs> uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, Naya today, our successes, our challenges, and also our hope for the future. I want to take you through a little bit of a journey through our emotions, uh, in particular mine, um, uh, giving you a sense of what it is like to you know, be in our family for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I feel denial. This is the first thing I felt when um, Naya was first diagnosed, and even before that. Um, she was diagnosed at, at three years old, um, but even at six months, Alexis um, <clears throat> was really keen onto it. She had her mother in, motherly instincts, and she really thought something was wrong. He wa she wasn't rolling over. She had little shakes that, I, in hindsight now, we, we believe were seizures, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, you know, so a lot of that going on, but we, you know, for me and doctors and friends and family, we kind of threw it out there as, hey, you know, she'll, she'll get over it, she'll, she'll grow out of that. So even the doctors were telling us this. Um, it wasn't until, you know, um, uh, you know, we got in touch with Syngap and, and went through that process around three years old, about three years ago, tw uh, 2020, um, that we finally got the got diagnosis for, uh, for Syngap. Um, so at two years of age, uh, the, the neurologist that we were seeing at the time gave Naya a 50-50 chance of, you know, catching up with, with her um, uh, behaviors and, and uh, 
things like that. Uh, I feel scared and anxious. At this point, Naya is three years old and diagnosed, but it's with a word I never heard before, Singap. I don't know what it is. Um, what is it? What does it mean for my child? Um, what kind of uh, support do you get out of a rare disease? You know, um, you know, there's always you, you always need funding and all that kind of uh, research, um, and unfortunately, not every uh, rare disease is, is picked up that way. We feel fortunate that Syngap was one of them, and that SRF was reaching out to us, and it was it was great to uh, to be in the S SRF family at that point. Okay, so just tell me how do I fix this, right? Okay, um, not really, right? So, um, no, no quick answer to that. Um, <clears throat> but I also feel blessed, lucky, and, and also volatile all at the same time. A mixture of emotions, even right now, as I speak to you, because, you know, um, it is difficult. Yes, my child has Syngap, but since she was uh, three years old for the last three years, um, she's been learning, communicating, playing, laughing, swimming. Um, she's doing a lot of things that we didn't even expect because like I said, three years ago, I did not even know what Syngap was. Um, so it's great to see that progress. She can speak a few words. She can say four to six words together and, uh, to express what she feels or what she wants. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, but will that learning continue or will it plateau? Uh, you know, what, what, what is that? What, what does the future look like for that? Um, she still has seizures. The biggest ones are especially at night, uh, you know, the, the scariest ones because she'll wake up in, in tremors. Um, and, uh, you know, you, after three years, uh, you know, it, you, you almost get used to it in a, little, in a way, but still at the same time, you're still in the back of your head. It's, it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to take all that in. Um, <clears throat> we still see uh, multiple specialists, uh, including dental. You know, she has to go to a specialist because she, she won't uh, get her teeth clean, so we got to see specialists for that. Um, we see our speech therapist and uh, our ABA therapist as well. Um, and we are still working on her fine motor skills, which is, uh, you know, one of the uh, significant uh, ones that we want to see her improve at. Um, like I said before, I feel lucky for this organization, also the science community for making progress in this. Um, I'm excited that, you know, um, there is hope out there uh, for that, uh, for the SRF, um, for the um, SYNGAP. Uh, I feel defeated at times, and I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, insurance, not an easy uh, thing to navigate. Uh, I'm very thankful for my wife here, being able to navigate that as best as she can, um, but it's a full-time job, and I know a lot of you guys know that and, and feel the same way. Um, <clears throat> absence seizures, that's the kind of seizure she has during, uh, during the day. Um, those are the most difficult for me. Even three years later, I still can't tell you. I'll, I'll talk to Alexis all the time. Was that a seizure? Was that one? Because it's just a, literally a flutter of the eye, you know, uh, uh, you know a fraction of a second, um, and it's gone, you know. Uh, the everyday battles, I uh, feel defeated on that as well sometimes. Getting her dressed for school, taking her medication, um, uh, or even battling the pharmacy for for medication like Alexis was doing today. Um, they were short stocked in our medication and we only have about two days left on it. Uh, so even that's a challenge at times. I feel concerned. Um, what happens when she becomes an adult, uh, you know? Um, how do we navigate the legal process for, you know, for things like a will, things like that to, uh, to ensure uh, you know, a, a, a smooth transition for her uh, in her adult life? And will treatment be available in time uh, for her uh, condition? And finally, I feel thankful. Thankful for the progress that Nia has made all these, uh, these last three years. All the support she's had from uh, her, her therapist um, to even the school that she goes to um, and, and others that, that take part in her life. Um, <clears throat> thankful that with what we can control, we have been able to give her safety and, and laughter as she needs it. Um, thankful for the people working here um, at the SRF group, the scientists and the volunteers. 
and also I'm thankful for her siblings that you know has really helped us quite a bit in this uh, venture. That's my story. I just wanted to share it with you. I hope to hear some of your stories uh, throughout today and tomorrow um, as well. Um, I think it's important to share that so we you know balance off of each other and and understand what we're going through. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next we have Polina Polanco. She is a sibling of a Syngapian. Um, hi everyone, my name is Paulina Polanco. Um, I'm a sibling to two 20 year olds. Um, they're twins. And their names are Esperanza and Libertad. A little higher. Yeah. Or SV and Libby for short. Um, they were diagnosed with SINGAP1 in 2020. And we didn't realize what um, an important diagnosis that would be until um, SB had a grand mal seizure for the first time ever in 2021, um, right before New Year's. Um, that night completely changed our lives. Um, before that, we thought that autism was the re main reason for their condition. Um, and we thought that SINGAP1 was just another diagnosis to add to the list. Um, Sorry, I'm really nervous. Okay, can you tell us what's the most important part of what you um, have been thinking? I know that I wrote um, I wrote a book that you're gonna hear more about later today, and I wrote it in order to sort of get my own thoughts down and to sort of know myself better. And in doing so, it really helped me. And um, I know Paulina here, as a sibling, has um, very bravely written some of her thoughts down, and she wants to share them too. And it's, I, I know for sure it's gonna help her. So that's, that's what we're doing. Can you tell me what the most important part is? Thank you, JR. Um, so the night that she had her seizure, um, I was the one who found her. Um, and that experience brought a lot of emotions to the surface that I had never really paid any attention to. Um, so I'm gonna read some parts of what I wrote. Um, it's gonna get a little deep, <laughs> so. Bear with me. Um, coming home from experiencing new parts of life and making new memories usually would have felt comforting. Back to my home, my sanctuary where I'm most comfortable. So why was I feeling anxious on the drive home? It's not that I don't want to be there and it's not that I don't want to help. I want to help in any way that I can because my sisters need all the support that they can get. And I know how heavy being a caretaker can be, both physically and mentally. And at the same time, feeling guilty and ridiculous all at once because I just went out and had a great time. Am I ungrateful? Am I selfish for wishing I could do these things more often without having to worry? In 2006, when they were diagnosed with autism, there wasn't much known about autism. It was all new to us and seemingly new to the general public as well. It was scary, daunting, and extremely confusing for me being that I was just nine years old. If the twins would have been born now, we would have had much more knowledge and would have been better equipped, or at least a vague understanding of what autism was. And 14 years later with the SINGAP1 diagnosis, 
it felt like deja vu. My parents are extremely supportive. They encourage me to go out and live my life, but I can't help but feel the way that I do. The thoughts of what it'll be like when they're gone linger around in my head frequently to the point where I've lost sleep over it. But when I do go out and have fun, I forget just for a moment about my reality. In those moments, I'm just me. I'm not my sister's keeper. I'm not a caregiver. I'm just me. It's freeing, but when I come home, it all hits me again. The fear, the anxiety, the unknowing, and again, I feel guilty because it's not anyone's fault. I would never want the twins, I would never want to make the twins feel unwanted, even if they don't know what that would mean or if they wouldn't care. I know, and I care. They feel the love and care that we have for them, and it shows when SB hugs me and presses her cheek against mine. And it showed when Libby's teacher said she was in a great mood the day after their birthday when we bought them an ice cream cake and sang in unison several times just to make Libby laugh. In reality, I think I'm happiest when my sisters and my parents are happy. But there's a deep sadness when I think about how it would have been if they could have learned to talk and hold conversations. I wonder if I would have gotten into fights with them for stealing my clothes, if we would have helped each other do our hair, had movie nights together, or sister dates with our other sisters. Sometimes I hope to see them in my dreams. I feel like I'm warning someone who never existed, never got the chance to exist, I know there's really no point in that, but I can't help but wonder. Despite all that, the twins deserve to be loved and cared for, cared for as they are, for what they are and what they are not. Their hearts are pure. They show us their raw emotions, their frustrations, when they aren't being understood, their joy at things we will never understand, their pain that they can express, their boredom that they don't know how to cure. I feel calm knowing that they have us to go through all of that with them. Libby and SB, words can't explain how much I love them. I love to hear them laugh. I love to see and hear about the cute and funny things that they do and how they surprise us with the things that they've learned. I'm proud when I hear them say things clear as day even if it's just to get what they want, such as I want cupcake, or to get us to leave with I want buy. I admire the incredible resilience they have despite all the hardships they've gone through. Similar to what Winnie the Pooh once said, if they live to be 100 years old, I hope to be 100 years and one day so that they never have to live a day without feeling genuinely cared for and loved. Sometimes I have to remind myself that I'm their sister and not their mom, and I'm allowed to make my own life too. Thanks to the twins, I am who I am. I owe my heart to them. I'm more understanding of humanity because I see it fully in them. I try to figure out what they're feeling, what they want, um, and what, why they do what they do. I examine how they react to things. I think about what might be causing certain behaviors so I can help reduce them or avoid them and make things easier for them. Helping them helps me be better. I feel so blessed to be able to be part of their lives, to know what pure, unconditional love is, and to know how it feels to give it without expecting anything in return, and being okay with receiving it in different ways that we aren't used to seeing. Growing up with Singapian sisters was a lot of things. It was unusual, it had its struggles, but it isn't something I would trade. Sometimes it feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel, but maybe that's because in reality, there is none. There are windows. There are parts where it's dark, parts where it feels like it's not bright enough, but there's light all along the way. It's all an ongoing process there will be hard times and there will be easy and amazing times. 
I'm grateful for all of it. And I'm grateful that so far my family and I have had the will to face these things and grow through them. And I hope we can continue to have the will and strength to keep going. Thank you. I bet you understand why we brought the tissues. Thank you, Paulina. All right, so from a different relative's perspective now, Ed is gonna talk about what it's like to be a grandparent of a Syngapian. And I'm just wondering whether anyone's gonna hear a word I say. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I'm Ed Gabler. I live in Northeast Ohio with my wife, Donna. We've been married for 43 years and have three uh, grown daughters. Our eldest is Jess Fairs. She's also a uh, SYNGAP volunteer and a member of the board of directors. And uh, she is um, mom to Cole. Um, Don and I have four grandkids, one of which is Cole. He is almost seven years old. He was diagnosed in 2019 with, guess what? SYNGAP 1. Cole is a fixture in our life. He loves to swim, of course. He loves to spin. He loves to swing. And he loves to play piggies with me. Um, what he doesn't like is not getting his way. And when he doesn't get his way, he likes to, for whatever reason, slam his face on his knee. And he does it over and over again. And uh, he has calluses on his knees. Um, but the biggest thing that I like about that is that when he's done, he's done. It's over. Then he reaches up his hand, he smiles at me, and then we go play and all is forgiven, even no matter what I did to make him mad. Um, but I am actually going to flip the script on this family stories and talk about volunteering with a SRF instead. Um, I started volunteering in 2022, uh, started out with a newsletter, which I still do, and then I went to Nashville. Nashville was horrible for me because I got so pumped up. I was so excited. It was an amazing event. I had never been around so many people before like this, and I was just jazzed. I was ready to go. And I think that Mike sensed this because... A couple days later, he sent out this baited hook with the name Ed all over it. And the bait was an email for a document that he said, please review and comment. And I love editing documents. So it's like, OK. But I wondered, why did he send it to me and several others? I thought that might have been a mistake. But the mistake wasn't his, it was me for commenting. Because as soon as I did, the day after, Mike sends out this very public message saying, I think Ed would make an amazing group five leader. I stepped into it. Yeah, thanks, Corey. I stepped into it. I asked Donna, um, should I do this? You know, should I really do this? She goes, I don't know, maybe you could do it, but you better ask Jess. And so I asked Jess, and she said, if you want to do it, do it. But two restrictions. One, go easy, because they're all volunteers. You're leading volunteers. Remember, they're not employees. You don't pay them, they're volunteers. And then she said the second thing, actually the first thing I think I'm doing okay on, right? Okay. The second thing though is don't embarrass me. And I'm sorry, it's every parent's job to embarrass their children, so I'm not worried about that one. Um, most of you, 
when you've come up to me, and I've met a lot of new people, and I've met a lot of people in person for the first time, but you've come up to me over the last couple of days, given me hugs, handshakes, whatever, and said, thank you for all the hard work that you do. And I appreciate that. But you know what? I don't do any more than any other volunteer in this room, on Zoom, or out in the world. I don't do any more than anybody else because all volunteers do what they can, do what they have time for. That's it. Some people have more time, but others don't. You know, you have, you have family, you have kids to raise, you, have, you go to school, you have a job. Well, I'm not raising kids anymore. I'm helping raise Cole and his brother and sister, but um, I don't have schooling. I don't have a job. I have time. So we're all giving what we can. The problem is we need more people because as we have seen over the last day and a half, SRF is growing. There are more cases. There are more scientists involved. There are more grants. There are more studies. There is more of everything, and we need more bodies to make it happen. Because if we don't, then we're going to lose out on opportunities, and we can't have that. I mean, look at this amazing event. Uh, I give it up for Ashley and everybody else who's been organizing this. This does not happen without volunteers, a lot of volunteers. So we need to, to be involved with that. Uh, grants and advocacy and fundraisers, trials, webinars, reaching out to new families. Thank you, Corey, and your team. Spreading the word. All of these things take volunteers and so many more things. Now, I'm not going to ask every single person to volunteer, and you don't have to volunteer any more than a couple hours or four hours or whatever you can give. But if you can give time, if you have time to give, give it. I am looking for more grandparents. That'd be nice. More guys on all these committee meetings. It seemed like Hans and I were the only guys involved. It's nice to have you know, a male face to be looking at. But please, you know, take a look at your schedule. See what you can give. There are plenty of opportunities, plenty of things that we need help with. Um, if you don't have time or energy, that's obviously understandable. Situations change, too. I know a lot of people who have volunteered, and then they can't volunteer anymore. That's understandable. But please consider it. Um, with Cole, he's obviously my reason, and all of the volunteers have a particular reason of why they do what they do. Um, but with Cole, I've always questioned, what's he going to look like when there is a cure? Is he going to, um, is he going to be able to talk? he doesn't talk? Is he going to be able to remember? Is he going to be able to avoid getting mad? Is he going to still forgive when I make him mad when I don't give him that sixth yogurt pouch before 10 o'clock in the morning that he wants? I don't know, but I want to find out. So if you're interested, see me, email me at curesingup1.org and join the team because we are an amazing team. Thank you very much. Okay, next up is Kathy Langdon. She's going to talk about transitioning a Syngapian into adulthood. Um, first, I need to say I am still emotional from two, you did an amazing job. That was so moving, so, so proud of you. Ed, that was also a great plug for volunteers. I will say I have enjoyed every second of the last two years being involved, so I second everything that Ed said. So. That having been said, um, my name is Kathy Langan, and my son Charlie is 23 years old, and he was diagnosed um, just three years ago. So I want to start by talking about how by age five through the ages of 21 or 22, depending on what state you live in, you are on a road with your school system. And that school system provides, obviously, the education, it provides therapies, it provides support, it also, it also um, provides social interactions for your child. 
And then that magic birthday happens, 21 or 22. And on that day, that road ends. It is a complete hard stop. And you're forced to take a sharp turn. And you take a turn onto a new road that is run by the government. And that new road has a new cast of characters. It has its own language. And it has its own set of rules and laws that you have to abide by which can be incredibly daunting and overwhelming. So what I want to talk about today are ways to prepare for this transition um, by focusing on four things. The first is the importance of starting early. You do not want to wait until your person is 18, 19. Don't even talk to me if they're 20 or 21. Like, you've got to start early. Um, and you need to identify during the early teen years their strengths in their interests so that you can put together a vision of what you want their life to look like. How can you prepare them to have a meaningful and purposeful life? And then the fourth thing is the critical importance of making connections with your state and with the programs that are out there. So that having been said, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about me. Um, my son, Charlie, has been a student at a residential program in Pennsylvania for the last eight years. And it has changed his life in ways that I never, ever could have imagined. A little bit of background about that is that by around age 12, um, he was regressing using his communication device. He had zero progress in activities of daily living. And the behaviors were so intense that I was really fearful that he was going to either hurt himself or hurt me. And it forced me to go down a road that I swear I never, ever would have considered, and that was looking at residential placements. And it broke my heart, but I knew I needed to do it. And so I looked locally, Massachusetts and the surrounding area. Nothing was a fit. And so I had to broaden my search. And that's when I found Camp Hill. It was a, a special education program unlike anything I had ever seen in my life. Um, it's an extended family living model in beautiful homes with parents and coworkers, a village setting, working farm. They grow their own vegetables and, and fruit. I mean, it was just incredible. And this is where Charlie became an entirely new human being. I'm not exaggerating. Um, he loved the routines, working with animals, being in morning and afternoon crews. He thrived being in nature, attending community events, and making meaningful connections with friends for the first time. Finally, he had a meaningful life by the age of 15. So I'm sharing this because I saw and continue to see how the right setting and having a purpose allows him to be the best version of himself. And I can't give him that at home. And when I say the best version of himself, I mean I saw that he was capable of more than I ever imagined. Um, yeah. So again, the right setting and the right purpose has completely changed him. So knowing this, now as I get ready for his transition into adulthood, um, I know that his adult program needs to be farm-based, rich with routines, access to um, social activities, having responsibilities, and, and a great degree of supervision. He still needs a lot of help. So what I'd like to say to you as you think about this, and I know it's really overwhelming, but starting early. You want to start in their teen years to really look at what their interests and activities are, even what their weaknesses are. I can tell you from my experience, Charlie is not a fine motor guy. Don't ask him to do crafts or drawing or painting. That, that can't be part of the equation. He's a gross motor guy. He always has been and always will be. I would also say look at environments where your, per, where your person is comfortable, happy, relaxed. Because being relaxed really helps with the anxiety and that re, can really, really helps with behaviors. And with all this in mind, you want to have a, a goal that by around the age of 18, you have a vision of what you want their life to look like. So that you can take that vision and you would 
get yourself involved with the ARC in your state. That's A-R-C. Every state has one. Not many people know about it till it's, you're too far down the road. And it is a wealth of information and resource and support. And their only job is to help you. That, that's nice. They have no other agenda. That's what they do. Um, so, yeah, so definitely get in touch with your ARC. You have your vision. But then you also want, with, with that vision in hand, to go look at the programs that are out there. Your state is gonna tell you you can't do it till they're turning 21 or 22. That's not true, you can. You just have to do it on your own. And what you wanna do is you wanna make real connections with the people who run those programs. Because what happens is the state, when you finally get to that point, they send out referral packets. And your referral packet is your kid. And that referral packet is sitting in a pile of like, I don't know, 20, 30, 100, because if it's a good program, that pile could be up to 200. So by starting early and making that connection and getting the relationship, you are a face in front of that person, but you're also the face of your child. So that when that referral packet ends up on their desk, they're gonna know about your kid and your kid. And that is really powerful because in addition, unfortunately, the waiting lists are long. So if you continue that communication, keep working on that relationship, it is incredibly helpful. Um, yeah. So the other part of this is that, I mean, our kids are so complicated. It's better for you to identify what you're looking for rather than expecting your state agency to do it. Um, if you're lucky, they'll help you. I've heard that happens. <laughs> But <laughs> they may not, and it become a real battle. Trust me on that. Um, I'm also just going to put this in here, and we're not going to get into it today. That's why I tried to focus it on four things. But the other piece about becoming an adult is obviously guardianship and setting up rep payee accounts. And that is its own separate subject with ours, with legal people. Like, I, I'm not going to touch on that. But I'm bringing it up because that is part of what's also going on as, as you get into these late years. The, the road really changes. The landscape is new. And so the sooner you start thinking, the better you'll be. I will share with you that I did start really early. And then there was the pandemic. So the places that I had found um, aren't taking new referrals. They have staffing shortages. Um, and so <laughs> I had to actually get very creative. Um, and I will share with you that uh, thinking outside of the box, I am now working with two other families, one of which uh, their son used to be a roommate with Charlie at Camp Hill, and we are creating our own program. That's what we've had to do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it's not something I ever thought I'd be doing. Frankly, it's not something I ever wanted to do. I, I've heard about people, oh, just you know, get, get some parents together, start a program. It is not like that at all. However, um, I got lucky, kind of saying what Mike said, maybe not smart, but I did get lucky and found these two families. And I'm really excited to be able to open a new program for very behavioral kids. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. All right, next we're gonna hear from Summer Slot, who's gonna talk Oops. a little bit about AAC devices. Oh, thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm a talker, not a speaker, so just beware. Um, <laughs> like Ashley said, um, my name's Summer Slat. Um, my family's back in the corner. If you guys can stand up, I'm gonna put you on the spot. This is my husband, Adam, my oldest, AJ, Brody, our caregiver, McKenna Bissett, and then the wild child, Riker. Um, I've been asked to speak on our journey with AAC devices. I'm not an expert, so again, this is just our journey. Um, Riker started speech therapy at uh, nine months old, and we weren't diagnosed until he was about four and a half, January of 2016. Um, and he 
we, our speech therapist just kind of worked on hoping he would talk, because again, we didn't have that diagnosis yet. So we were, for, we were hopeful that he would be able to talk. Um, what I regret about that looking back now is um, I wish we would have started an AEC device earlier. Um, we jumped into PEX because we really wanted him to learn how to initiate conversation first. So if you are not into an AEC device yet and your child doesn't know how to initiate conversation rather than him just putting a, pushing a button saying, I want yogurt, I want yogurt, versus looking you in the eye, tapping you on the shoulder, I would encourage you to do PEX first. Um, once we got into the AEC device, um, we trialed Proloco to go, and then we trialed uh, LAMP Words for Life. What we found best for our family and for Riker is LAMP Words for Life. Um, it's language acquisition motor planning. Our kids are like little GPSs. Um, if you think of like a keyboard, it makes zero sense in where the keys are placed, but once you know the keyboard, it's just motor planning process. And the same goes for LAMP. Like Riker, just as soon as he knows, every, the buttons don't change. Proloco to go, as soon as you added a new word, the buttons shift, and then they don't remember where it's going. So we want communication to be easy, quick, fast for them, right? Just because that also brings behaviors. And so um, LAMP has been amazing. It is not the easiest, but modeling, 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 work with your speech therapist. Um, the other thing I guess I would suggest too is don't just buy the iPad and put the software on it. Go get it as a dedicated speech generating device. Work with your speech therapist. You're gonna need a prescription from your physician. Um, insurance is gonna deny you. We were denied probably three times and it took us over a year to finally fully get it. Um, don't stop, you'll get it. Um, but with this speech generating device, basically for his, his is called a Prio Mini. So it's a mini uh, iPad that they turn into a speech generating device. It has an amplification on the back because an uh, iPad isn't gonna really um, reach the back of a classroom if he's in school or she's in school. Um, so the amplification process on that is really nice. Um, and then it's a prescription, so it goes with them at all times. Um, so that's my big thing that I loved is the teacher can't say it's disruptive. They say, can't say, sorry, we can't have that in here. It's a prescription, it's with them. So I really encourage you to go that way. Um, it also brings out their humor. Um, little story with Riker. Um, <laughs> once he started learning, it was in first grade, they brought little chickens in the classroom. And the teacher's like, Riker, look at the baby chicks. And his first comment was, chicken nuggets. <laughs> and at first I thought, like, well, maybe he's just thinking it's just chicken, you know, because that's the only, no, he was thinking chicken nuggets. So we've learned with Riker being able to commun communicate, he has a really dark sense of humor, which is really fun. Um, the other one, um, uh, excuse my language, we had to add shit to his talker. Um, because again, the process with communication is as you learn a word, you add the word. Well, he learned the word shit um, because of mom. Um, <laughs> when he, um, you know, there are, our kids are typical in there too. So he'll get this little mischievous grin on his face and I'm like, you're being a little shit. Well, one day I called him a turkey and he kept, he points to his hands like this, like another option mom. So I went through the list of all the nicknames that I call him and he just kept saying, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. and I'm like, there is no way. And so I said, little shit. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I had to go to parent teacher conference, let them know I had to add that. Um, so that was fun. But just like any child, they have access to that word, right? Whether they're supposed to use it or not, that's our job to teach them when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. Because they're still kids and we still should train them just, educate them just like our neurotypical kids. So if you guys have any questions on AAC devices, if you would like to look at Riker's device, um, he is welcome. He would be happy to share it with you. And uh, yeah, that's our story with AAC devices. Thank you, Summer. Next, we have a brand new pretty fresh face for our community. Nice. This is Justin Rowe. He is fairly newly diagnosed, and I think you're going to enjoy listening to what he has to say. <laughs> Hi, my name's Justin. Uh, Jessica over there videotaping me. Thanks for that. And Grayson, our Syngabian, and Jackson. We have two older boys that aren't here. Um, I was going to talk to us about 
our diagnosis, which is already. <laughs> Very hard. He began when he was in, let's say, a year and a half. He started crouching uh, and holding his head in July. He would hide. It's really hard. We didn't know what was wrong. I took him to the doctors, and they just gave us no answers at the pediatrician. Wasn't very helpful. He was behind on walking. He was behind on speaking. Again, no help. We really had a push to get any help. Sorry. <laughs> We finally got a seizure common camera when he was playing with his blocks. And once the pediatrician saw that, she said, oh, okay, maybe something is wrong. We've been telling you that. Um, went and got a, gosh, I should have recorded this. <laughs> Made it a lot easier. Um, uh, so she set up to get an EEG done, and thank you. <laughs> we had to go uh, to Fresno, right? Had to go up to Fresno, a couple hour drive. Uh, set him up with an EEG. He had to sleep for it. So the first 30 minutes, nothing came up. When he was awake, nothing came up. And we were going to leave, and I remember, I was like, I know. I know how to make it happen. So I gave him his binky, his eyes rolled, and they had the reading that they needed um, to get us set up. They said it was going to be um, a month until we saw a neurologist. So we weren't going to see him, I believe, until November, um, initially. Um, and so when we went to leave, they gave us a call and said, no, we needed you to come in tomorrow. So that was scary. Because we were thinking, no, no, it would be no big deal. But then when a doctor tells you you need to come in the next day, that's the scary part. We walk in the next day to the neurologist. He says, I think Grayson has epilepsy, and I would like to start him on Keppra, and we can do an MRI, and then if you'd like, we could do genetic testing to see what medications would work best or and what would work worst. And we, at the time, had only seen a few seizures, so we didn't want to start with Keppra, because once we started looking into Keppra, we saw all the behavioral side effects, and Grayson over there. This is the sweetest little boy. Sorry. And I didn't want to make him into a monster, seeing all the bad behavioral side effects. And so we didn't pursue with that, and we wanted to wait. So we did the genetic testing to see what would work best for him. My wife sent me alone <laughs> to go to this because we were thinking, oh, it's epilepsy. We're just going to find out what medication is going to be best for him. So I went with Gray, um, and the neurologist hands me the paperwork, says, your son has Syngap-1. Um, it's going to cause seizures, uh, learning disability, and autism. I didn't know what to say or what to do. I was confused. 
I tried to ask him questions. He had no knowledge of the disease or what to do. And that. That was terrifying. Um, so, the next day, because <laughs> I'm a fixer, as all men are, I started Googling <laughs> how to fix it. And I found Anderson and Davis <laughs> doing research on mice on a cure for Syngap. So I went there <laughs> to try to find him. <laughs> And I found his research building, and I found a way in, because I was not supposed to be in there. But I wanted answers, and I wanted help. Luckily, he wasn't there, because <laughs> that would have been really awkward. But I, found, I ran into some nice ladies there. They were uh, students that were working on it. Um, they told me to look up. Um, groups, uh, support groups, and try to, you know, figure out ways um, to get answers that way. And um, that's when I found Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate everything you've done for me, my family, and all the other families here. We're all counting on you guys. I appreciate it. You know that we have all been there. We may not have trespassed, <laughs> but we have all been there. <laughs> And we feel and have felt and will feel again all of these raw emotions, right? You are not alone. Okay, um, something that we all deal with are behaviors. And we have among us someone who knows more about severe behaviors in her adults and Gapian than nearly any of us can possibly imagine on a daily basis. Jackie Cancier is... Um, one of the best advocates for making sure your children have the support they need and for being there when we absolutely need them and learning how to, how to handle what we can handle. And she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about severe behaviors. Hey everyone, I am Jackie Cancier. Jaden is my daughter. Hi Jaden, say hi to everybody. Hi Jaden. Um, you know, Jaden's 20 years old and she was diagnosed at 16. Um, and honestly, the diagnosis of SYNGAP1 for us was a joy because we had already experienced all the symptoms by the time we got the diagnosis. So for a new family, this is a really scary thing. And having me up here, it's only going to get scarier. Um, hold on one moment, please. Um, and so, but the reason we were getting genetic testing done again um, was because she had gone through a regression. And physically and behaviorally, our lives were becoming out of control. And they only got worse from there. Um, I'm standing up here dripping in privilege, really, right? I am a, a white woman. I am educated. We had enough money. I, I'm a third generation advocate. My mother was a rock star advocate. Her mother was a rock star advocate. And so this should be easy, or at least doable for me. I have been living in that moment of, I can't do this anymore. I, ca I can't do this anymore. Over and over and over again, consistently, without 10 minutes of a break from it, for years. It is a constant 
trauma that you have to learn to make part of your normal if you are going to choose to try to keep them at home if they hit this level of behaviors. Um, and for those that do place their children, that's not an easy decision either. And it's not like you suddenly can rest because you're constantly worried. You're, you are constantly on the calls with staff. My mom has my grandfather in respite right now, and the agency's called her like two or three times while she's in Florida. You know, When you are this level of a caregiver, it doesn't matter what the housing situation is. You are always going to be this level of a caregiver. And the behaviors are the most debilitating symptom of SYNGAP1 for many of us. And just even SRF, I've seen it evolve in the past few years. I know when I first came on to scene, uh, I think that the, the conversations I have about behaviors were hard. And they, we didn't want to scare new parents. I, I, the webinar I did a couple years ago, um, I don't know where Olga's at, but I can remember Olga and I talking about, well, maybe we should change the name, the title of the webinar. We shouldn't call it Severe Behaviors. Why don't we just call it Advocacy? Because we don't want to scare the new families. And I was like, no, we need to call it Severe Behaviors. This is what's coming down the pipe, and they need to know, they need to be prepared, because I wasn't prepared, and that, that made it worse. So we did, we called it Severe Behaviors, and now today, you know, here might be like, this is happening, you need to get behind this. And I've seen that change happen. So as the rest of our kids are getting older, we're starting to see that it's more likely than not that you're gonna have this. And when I talk about severe behaviors, there's actually a special interest group on severe behaviors that's with Profound Autism Alliance, National Council on Severe Autism, Autism Speaks, and the Council for Autism Service Providers, CASP. And they are now actually trying to change it to dangerous behaviors. The term, instead of severe behaviors, let's call this what it is, it's dangerous behaviors. We are talking severe forms of aggression, um, self-injury, and very dangerous self-injury, elopement, uh, property destruction. When Mike talks about picking your furniture, based on this, 100%. I wasn't even done paying off my last couch when it was torn to shreds and broken and flipped and had to buy a new couch. The new couch I bought has a completely metal frame, all of the, all of the seats recline, you know? So like, she's not picking that up and flipping that. And that, I, it has changed how I buy my furniture based on these behaviors. Staffing, forget it. Because I'll, we are not talking about this. Advocacy on severe behaviors is very rare. We have now realized that about 27% of people with an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis have profound autism, which is where SYNGAP1 would lie. But for years, our research has been excluding this part of the population, which is why Dr. Frazier's work is so important, which is why when we're out here with the EEG that you can wear at home, that's so important, because we need research methods that are accessible and that include our children in the data. Because this data doesn't just sit on a shelf in, in some college library. It doesn't just reside within the medical offices. This data and the research that pushes out then becomes part of evidence-based policy. Evidence-based policy that has nothing to do with our kids. And actually, in some ways, is very harmful. So for us, we have been now hearing this toxic positivity messages of take the dis out of ability. Don't talk about the disability, talk about the special ability. Meanwhile, I'm getting the crap beat out of, out of me on a daily basis. My house is destroyed. I haven't been able to see a ball game of JJ's in three years, right? My mom has to fly in from Pennsylvania to be down here so I can even be standing on this stage right now. And yet we can't get staffing because our HCBS policies now say they have to be free of coercion and restraint. So those of you that got a little live demonstration in the uh, music room yesterday, I had to put Jaden into, that is a restraint. Now, a lot of people, when they hear that word, they think prone physician, George Floyd, this is like abusive, but physically having to place your hands on somebody else to hold her hands down onto her hips so she's not smacking herself in the face or punching the music therapist or anything like that. That's a necessity 
But they're not allowed to do that in an HCVS setting in many states. So if your staff can't do that, they're at risk being in your house. It's increasing risk of police interactions, having somebody who cannot properly intervene in these behaviors. They are not a moral defect. They are a symptom of a disability, a very real symptom of a disability. We do have research on that now. It is very validating. And on the tables, I put this. This is important. I'm going to give it to Ed or Mike or somebody, too, so it's a file you can download. But this is not comprehensive. These are some ideas. And this is the approach every doctor you have, everyone, I don't care if it's the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, every doctor you have, you need to ask them it, how they feel about a biopsychosocial model. Because this is not yet mainstream medicine. It is emerging and, and getting more popular, but it's not currently mainstream medicine. And this is what we need when you're talking about severe behaviors. Yes, you're going to have ABA, but you cannot expect ABA to solve all of this. This is not going to be solved by ABA alone. We're talking about neurologically driven behaviors that sometimes have absolutely no rhyme or reason. I don't care how well you plan the environment, how great of a caregiver you have, it doesn't matter. They're still going to happen from time to time. And you need to know how to properly prepare. So there are some things in here that I didn't put on, like, for example, sleep. Can anybody tell me where you might think sleep goes in on this chart? We've got biology, which can be certain biological symptoms or, that are causing behaviors. We have psychology, which we all generally think about with behaviors. But then we have social also down there. Sleep actually could go anywhere, right? And so that's why some of these things aren't in here. And that there are, it's a Venn diagram, so some of these things are going to overlap. And some things will pile on, and there'll be multiple causes to behaviors that'll be very complex. And so keeping this idea in mind, where we're not ruling out uh, joint pain, maybe we're ruling it in, right? Both things can happen at the same time. Maybe this is something where this person is having an issue with school, they have new staffing, but also they're feeling pain right now. So we're going to have to attack this from two different places. So once you are dealing with severe behaviors, your life becomes a constant scanning of all the different things, a lot of documentation. Write down any changes in the environment. Your BCBA will be your data friend because they collect all of this. They'll put a dotted line down and Catalyst started new medication, uh, had a new, new staff start at school, all these different things. That kind of data helps you start to unravel this and make your life manageable. Just like Sydney said in the beginning, some of us are never going to be seizure free. Some of us are never going to be behavior free. But we can live joyful lives if we learn how to manage it and manage it appropriately. And it requires good advocacy where you're not afraid to talk about this. You're not ashamed of it any more than a parent wheeling their child with cerebral palsy in a wheelchair would be. I have to use physical intervention with my daughter as a medical service to her to keep her free from police interaction, hospitalizations, and institutions. And I am not ashamed of that. And I'm happy to debate it in any kind of forum. This is a part of the population that is not as uncommon as we have been led to believe. It is a part of the population which has been silenced. And that stops today. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie.